Sure. But that was the extent of how much Curb Your Enthusiasm mentioned COVID in the new season uh, when it returned from the pandemic break. And looks like Albert Brooks hiding the PPE. Uh, most TV shows now seem to be hiding the entire pandemic and their metaphorical closet. They just want to move on. Let's bring in right now chief television critic for The New York Times, James Ponowazic. Uh He wrote about this over the weekend, and he joins us now. And I got to admit, James, there, there were some of the, I think, succession had these scenes where people were wearing masks and others. And I was like, ah. I, 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 even though I, I'm very conservative with a small C on masks and everything else, I didn't want to see it on TV. It looks like that's a calculation that a lot of uh, TV shows are making now. Well, you know, like everybody else during the pandemic, TV producers have had a rough, lot of rough choices to make, you know, one of which was, do you just ignore the pandemic as if it never existed? Do you lean fully into it and make it part of your show? I think what we're seeing now going into the second and then going on the third year of the pandemic is this uh, kind of uh, uh, unsettling phenomenon where shows are sort of taking the standpoint of, okay, in the world of our show, the pandemic did happen and it existed and it was a real thing uh, and it was a big deal, but now it's over. It somehow got fixed, yada, yada, yada. And the rest of you are sort of uh, uh, out on your own, which often ends up being kind of a, a more unsettling thing than never acknowledging the pandemic in the first place. Yeah, yeah. And, you and know, of course, I, uh, Larry David. Yeah. Oh, oh I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. You know, I mean, I will say, sorry. you know, uh, to it was. Curb Your Enthusiasm's approach is, is almost worth it simply to hear John Hand get to say, you know, it's a Shonda uh, on television. Uh, uh, but th there is this sort of, you know, a cognitive dissonance that you get now where you see an example of, say, a show like Grey's Anatomy do a season that, you know, on a medical show is set within the pandemic and is dealing with it and approaching it. And then it comes back and it's sort of, well... We've kind of done this long enough. We are now in a post-pandemic reality. Good luck to the rest of you. Yeah, it, it, it's sort of what This Is Us did. Um, they they obviously uh, had mask wearing and had had leaned into it uh, until they didn't. Just stopped. Yeah, and you know, I, I I understand there are no great choices. You know, like like a lot of things with the pandemic, and you know, there is the argument. Well, people want to watch television to escape, you know, but I think that people don't necessarily want to watch television to deny things. They would, they, they, they want to be, you want to be entertained. You want to sort of escape emotionally into a story, but you know, you look at the history of television, all in the family, for instance, in the 1970s, you know, that was not just some, you know, obscure critical darling that only critics like this was the number one show on television for years. It was totally about, America's problems and the things that upset people and the arguments that they had at, at home and with the, with their neighbors and it, you know delved into it in an entertaining emotionally affecting way uh, you know but but so I, you know I don't think I don't think necessarily that TV entertainment and dealing with you know in this case the sort of big totalizing problem that's going on literally in the entire world, for the past couple of years. I don't think they're necessarily mutually exclusive, e even though obviously it doesn't make sense for every show. Different shows have a different level of reality to them. Yeah, and you know, you, you, you talked about uh, All in the Family. That was a show that in the 1970s, uh, everything stopped in my conservative uh, household on, I think it was yep. Saturday nights on CBS. We would stop. We would watch All in the Family. Uh, all of us would be, you know, dying laughing and you take it through the Waltons and uh, Mary Taylor Moore. Uh, you, you had that in the 70s and the 80s, of course, you had Cosby Show and other shows that everybody would just stop and watch. In the 90s, of course, Bob Saget was part of a couple of shows uh, that uh, I think really were sort of, at least in my life, were sort of on the end of that appointment viewing where networks can yeah. say this on this night. And in, in, in Bob's case, it was ABC on this night. Everybody's going to stop and they're going to watch what we've packaged for them from eight to eleven. Yeah, you know, I think what we're seeing in the in the emotional outpouring to Bob Saget's death, which, you know, I think, you know, affected 
a lot of people clearly very deeply is on one level. I think that is sort of the 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 ta the 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 legacy of the tail end of this big network era of when a, millions of people sort of communed together around the same things and all developed this kind of fatherly attachment to his character and the actor. And something that we used to see in the past with television, and I don't know whether we'll see it as much in the future, you know, now that we all sort of have the, the algorithm serving us up our own custom tailored shows on, on Netflix and so forth. Hey, James. Good morning. It's Jonathan Lemire. You also wrote over the weekend about Sidney Poitier and his legacy. We also lost him in the last few days. Uh, give us a little sense of how you believe he'll be remembered in the decades to come. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I think he's a, a legendary figure in entertainment, not simply for being a great actor uh, and not simply for being one of the first black actors uh, to, you know, have widespread national and world recognition, but but really for having, you know, created that legacy and that resume of achievement within the strictures of what, you know, black male lead actors were allowed to do at the time that, you know, his his career was was at its peak. He was he was limited in the romantic roles that he could take. He was limited in the, you know, sort of amount of agency that that his characters had and yet was able to bring to them, you know, a real commanding presence uh, and a real authority that both spoke to his ability and I think, you know, that that inspired people you know, beyond the screen, out in the real world. I think that was, you know, one of those those rare cases of, you know, a, a sort of fictional artistic performance that really touches the larger world. Really did and, and broke so many barriers uh, across the United States and the world. Uh, Chief television critic for The New York Times, James uh, Panawazic, thank you so much for being with us. We really do appreciate it. And Coming up next, the United States is now averaging more than 700,000 new coronavirus cases every day. And Dr. Fauci says he wouldn't be surprised if daily cases go over a million. Steffi Rule picks up the coverage on that and much more right after the final break. Hey, thanks so much for watching our YouTube channel. You can follow up on today's top stories and breaking news or catch up on your favorite MSNBC shows all in one place. Download the NBC News app today.